the witch's schools, the bear, the viper, the cat, the griffin and the wolf. It always seemed to us that their history was lost in the mysteries of time. It seemed that no one would ever know about them. How did they come into being? Who founded them? What are their traditions? What is their history? But years passed and the developers of CD Projekt Red lifted the veil of secrecy. And the old witcher is ready to tell you about the fate of the witcher schools. In our previous video, we talked about the beginnings of the witcher mutant phenomenon itself. A phenomenon that started with an idea and came to life eventually. And today we will continue our story. We will answer many questions. How did witchercraft develop? How did the principles of the order of monster hunters come about? How did the witchers gather their knowledge? How did their order become strong and stronger? And how did it all fall apart? The old witcher from the school of the beer <laughs> is right here. But thank our patrons for their support, without whom the videos on our channel would be less frequent. And we encourage you to join their ranks. And we finally begin this amazing story. The first name is Alzer. As always, there is a first name in a story about the origins of witchers, and it should be only that. After the experimenters and the first witchers were exiled from the order, they went their own way. Alzer, Cosimo Malaspina, their apprentices and the first of the witchers arrived at Castle Morgreg in the Kestrel Mountains. They settled there, made it the first stronghold of the witchers. Yep, Morgreg was the home of the first witchers and no one knew about Ger Morhen at the time, but that's a different thing. The sorcerers of Morgreg continued their research and experimentation with a new idea no longer to create perfect superhumans, but perfect monster slayers. Only a few years passed, and the first generation of witchers, created with the formulas that Alzer and Malaspina had derived earlier, were called ready. As usual, all these mutations and experiments were accompanied by many training sessions for the surviving children. These trainings became part of the normal routine. A few months before the end of the training, a new, a special master swordsman appeared in the fortress. He trained the young witches for free. Everyone recognized him by the red griffin on his shield. He kept saying that these boys were born and went through terrible trials for a great purpose. Nothing in this world happens for no reason. And many souls were set on fire by his speeches. They needed to be convinced. They needed a purpose. This was the beginning of the Witcher Codex. Slaying monsters is the witches call it. They must serve as beacons of light in the world of darkness. They must save people from the evil that waits in the night and lurks there. Witchers are protectors, knights of the new age. With such thoughts, the first generation of mutant monster slayers took to the highlands and to the highway. They wore light armor and carried silver and steel swords in their packs behind their backs. They knew nothing yet, how to find orders, how to ask for payment, how to approach people, how to kill this or that monster. They had to learn. Every winter, they returned to Castle Morgreg. They drank, discussed missions and orders, told stories, mourned fallen comrades. Year after year, knowledge of monsters accumulated. It got recorded. The deaths from quests and orders decreased. The number of witchers grew. The first golden age of witchcraft had begun, though people were still wary of the unfamiliar mutants. There was no particular aversion. The witchers did their work quickly and efficiently. This served as the best advertisement. Against the backdrop of people no longer being afraid of monsters, the number of parishioners in the local temples of the Eternal Fire decreased. In the past, people used to go to the churchmen for protection from monsters. Now there was almost no need for that. So the propaganda against the monster hunters began. The churchmen accused them of all the deadly sins, used every opportunity to slander them. Unfortunately, their strategy had results. The god-awful mutants began to be treated with caution, but they were not yet hated. And that was the most important thing. There was still work to be done. Still, the Order of Witchers had problems where they were least expected, within the Brotherhood itself. The United Brotherhood of Witchers did not suddenly begin to fall apart. The split was preceded by a very important event. Two fathers of the whole experiment, the progenitors of the idea of creating witchers, Cosimo Malaspina and Alzer, had left. One day, the great experimenters realized that they were treading water in their research. The mortality rate among the boys who were to become witchers rose. The magicians were unable to reduce the number of deaths. And even more, 
to develop physical abilities without turning the new witchers into beasts was impossible. Their idea came to its logical conclusion. It had been about three decades since Alzer had chosen the first boys and girls for his experiments, and about 25 years since the day the experimenters, along with the first young witchers, were expelled from the Brotherhood of Sorcerers, exiled and recognized as renegades. During this time, several generations of new witchers have entered the world, their numbers measured in dozens and approaching hundreds. The process of creating monster hunters has been fine-tuned to the point where even the most incompetent adepts can handle it. Alzer and Cosimo Malaspina had many students. The fame of the renegades, who had created a superhuman and who, even without a conscience, were constantly experimenting with humans, spread quickly. Tired of being lectured by the sorcerers of Bernard and other schools, the students themselves ran away and sought out the witch's stronghold to learn from Alzer. Eventually, there were so many of them that Cosimo Melaspina and his famous apprentice simply left. The apprentice witchers knew enough and could control the necessary processes themselves. On the same day, the entire witch brotherhood began to crumble before their eyes. The first winter after Melaspina and Alzer left, there was a bloodbath. The reason, as is often the case, was a difference in the ideas and desires that drove each individual witcher. It was all about work. Witchers were traveling the entirety of the known continent and often they crossed paths. For the most part, this wasn't a problem. Whoever found the contract first claimed it, and the other witcher would respect that claim. After all, there were plenty of contracts and plenty of settlements in need. But as we spread, we began to quarrel among ourselves. Witchers would return from the path telling tales of brothers who tricked them out of contracts or drew steel on them, threatening to kill them if they didn't move on. The moment when the first blood would be shed in these disputes was only a matter of time. The authoritative Cosimo Melaspina and Alzer, who could resolve such conflicts with a firm hand, were gone, and so the witchers became their own masters, each living by their own rules. Shortly after the sorcerers left, one winter when all the monster slayers gathered in Castle Morgrake, a badly wounded witcher named Riss was found near the fortress. He was covered in blood, and it was a miracle that he did not die. The elixirs and the care of his brothers helped save him. When Riss was able to open his eyes, he told a terrible story. He only smiled when asked what kind of monster had done this to him. It turned out that Riss had been sliced from navel to neck by his own brother a witcher named Arnegad. Everyone knew the latter well. He was quite famous among his peers. A tall, broad-shouldered man about nine palms across, Arnegad was born stubborn. He hated being told what to do and despised authority. He valued independence above all else. He always wore a bear skin, a trophy from an animal he had killed himself. But that was not all he was known for. Everyone knew his rather reserved and straightforward character. He took his work simply, without any romance or illusions about saving the world from monsters. The reason for the dispute between Riss and Arnegad was a mission for a short, deep in the fortress of Kedwen. Riss was the first to arrive for the job, had already made arrangements with the village mayor and was preparing for the difficult work ahead. But 24 hours later, Arnegad arrived in the same Kedwen village. Arnegad arrived for the same job, the same order. When the huge witcher found out that Riss had already taken the job, he became incredibly angry, and when Riss also refused to give him the job, Arnegad decided that there were no more obstacles. He took the order by force. He attacked a fellow witcher and miraculously didn't kill him. Their fight was stopped by the chort. After the monster appeared, all of Arnegad's attention was focused on the monster. Riss, however, managed to escape with serious wounds. With his last breath, he made it to Morgraig where he was literally pulled from the other side by fellow witchers. It was there that he told his story. Everyone who listened to Riss made up their minds in the same moment. They had ignored the obvious for too long. Blood had been shed because of that. Now it's a problem that must be solved. Well, winter will set things right. All the witchers gather at Morgraig's castle in this cold season, so Arnegad will come too. He was expected. They knew he would not surrender but they did not expect that he would not come alone. Around him, the witcher with the bear skin on his shoulders gathered the same sullen, silent and discontented people. He knew that a trial awaited him at Castle Morgraig, but Arnegad's pride would never allow him to leave in disgrace, much less would it allow him to run away and never return to the castle. 
it was clear that he had already made up his mind. He was preparing for battle. He wanted it and he got it. After a brief argument, he gave an ultimatum that no one wanted to accept, except for those witchers who were already on his side. And the bloodshed began. The air itself whistled with sharp, swift blows and pirouettes. At the same time, the magic of the witcher's signs exploded in all the colors of the rainbow. Only wounded and dead bodies fell in the courtyard of Morgrave with no screams. The witchers had no need to express their physical pain. Arnegad was the one who killed the most, until he clashed with a witcher named Erland of Larvik. Erland attacked the fearsome giant himself, hiding under the protection of Quen, thinking himself safe. But Arnegad's blow was lightning fast and surprising, of truly titanic power. The blow shattered the Quen's protective barrier into tiny shards and slashed Erland across the face. Only miraculous reflexes saved the life of the reckless monster hunter. Despite the blood spurting from his cheek, Erland continued to fight. All his skills were in play. He was at the limit of his concentration. Each time he escaped Arnigan's blows at the last moment, and each time only the briefest of moments saved him from death. And once again, not one, but two free milliseconds when the huge bear skin wearing Witcher hesitated. With all his remaining strength in his hand, he aimed a powerful blow of pure art at Arnegad. Even such a big man could not withstand that sure fire of an attack. Art knocked him to the ground and disarmed him. The huge sword flew back to the wall of Morgrake. Yes, very soon Arnegad was back on his feet. But there was no longer that unshakable confidence in himself and that unbreakable strength in his eyes. By the end of the night, the surviving minions of Arnegad, with Arnegad himself at their head, had been driven from the castle. They retreated and finally fled down the slopes of the nearby mountains. The battle ended as suddenly as it had begun. It left only devastation and death in its wake. And there was still work to be done. The remaining witchers in the castle had to give their fallen brethren a proper burial. From that day until the end of time, everything changed. The United Order of Witchers ceased to exist. It split into two and after a while into more factions. The survivors of the battle realized that nothing would ever be the same again. For the time being, however, they continued to perform all the rituals they were accustomed to, following the Witches' Codex invented by Alzer, which was not that much to believe. Questions began to arise in the mind and on the lips of many Witchers. Why do we fight for people who hate us? Why do we accept such low payment? Why don't we kill humans or elves or whoever else we're paid to kill? As for Arnegad, huh, only death could stop him. He and his companions headed south, crossed Temeria, Sodom and Sintra. Finally, they found what they were looking for, an abandoned dwarven stronghold on the steep slopes of the Amel Mountains. It was as impregnable as it was harsh. Together, the exiled witchers settled in this place, filled it with life, adapted it to their existence, built a few more high walls around it. They turned the ruins of the dwarven castle into their new stronghold, and they called it Hare and Kadok. To distinguish themselves from the other witchers, they chose a crest, the head of a bear. The medallion with the bear's head engraved on it became their special mark of distinction. They sent a message to the world that they were not like other witchers, and soon, Word spread around the special bear witchers who were said to be physically incredibly strong and could strangle a basilisk with their bare hands. The whole world needed to know that there were special monster slayers. Meanwhile, Heron Kadok had become a structural replica of Castle Morgreg. Some sorcerers had escaped with Arnegad. They knew the secrets of mutagens and elixirs, and soon there was a need for fresh blood. The new witcher fortress needed young apprentices. The new structure of witchers needed to develop, to grow in numbers and skill, and to achieve the greatest effect, Arnegad, together with his closest associates, created a system of selection. To earn the honor of wearing a medallion with the head of a bear, a young adept had to pass special tests. Heron Kadok became known as the School of Witchers, the School of the Bear. Needless to say, the conditions in which the young adepts grew up were harsh, even by the standards of monster hunters. After all, if the average survival rate of 4 out of 10 boys after the trial of grasses remained, further losses were much more significant. First, there was the incredible cold. The Amel Mountains had never been a very comfortable place to live. As for the witchers who practiced outdoors most of the day, it was even harder for them. 
Every day, they had to shovel snow from the courtyard of Heron Kadok, and every day, the snow covered everything back again. Many froze to death in the first few days. Others became sick. Only a small fraction of the hardiest survived, those worthy of becoming a witcher of the School of the Bear. Training in snow, trials in cold, study in frost, and at the end, a trial, but not an easy one. The mountain trial was the name of the final exam in the Bear School. The adept had to get to the top of Gorgon Mountain. Yep the same one that were playing an important role in the fate of the Witcher Geralt of Rivia hundreds of years later. There were no landmarks on the way, except the stiffened corpses of failed Witchers, as if they were guiding stones pointing the way. Avalanches, rock slides, narrow mountain paths and monsters wait in each of the caves, where the young Witcher planned to spend the night. And on top of the Gorgon Mountain there were rune stones. The adept had to pick one up and go down with it to bring it to Heron Kadok. Only upon his return will he receive the proud title of the Witcher of the School of the Bear. Soon the highways were filled with a new breed of monster slayer, strong sturdy witchers in heavy armor. They were not known for their speed or stealth, but they could withstand the worst wounds, take orders from anyone and fight even the deadliest monsters. Behind their backs was a massive two-handed sword. These monster hunters were especially popular on Skellige where there were always plenty of jobs to be done and orders to be fulfilled, and people with similar temper to these witchers. Just as tough, pragmatic and stubborn. Even the Jarls of Skellige were happy to use the services of mutants who knew no fear. The islands quickly filled with the natives of Heron Kadok, and there was even a myth that the school of the bear was located on Skellige. The headstrong Arnegad, in his stubborn self-confidence, was able to create something new. Over at Heron Kedok, young apprentices could learn witchcraft without the distraction of useless knightly virtues. They were instilled with a love of complete independence. This would later lead to the dissolution of the school. But early on, many in the halls of Morgrake began to whisper that Arnegad had succeeded. It is rather ironic that the next fracturing occurred in the School of the Bear. The unruly witchers raised by Arnegat did not understand the words subordination or respect for elders. Pragmatism ruled them. They got paid much more for an assassination rather than for another drowner. And besides, they had a special purpose, to destroy the wild hunt. The story of how the Ghost Riders, which even many witchers considered nothing more than a fairy tale, became the reason for the creation of a new school of witchcraft and its main enemies begins with the name of Ivor Evil Eye. This witcher was trained in Heron Kadok and was surprisingly tough. The sorcerers kept experimenting with him, not wanting to let him go. Eventually, the boy was nearly driven to his grave. Mutagens and elixirs of unimaginable power were tested on him and a number of his brothers, killing them in minutes and moments. Only Ivor survived the first phase of the experiment, but the sorcerers dare not proceed to the second phase. The death rate was too high. The experiment was a failure. They simply let the boy go, and he had to live with the consequences. One of Ivor's eyes no longer even resembled the cat's pupil. It became more like a bloody snake's eye. Few knew that this disfigurement had not only given Ivor his nickname, but also a special ability. He could see beyond worlds. He now had the ability to see the entire Great Spiral. Many universes were revealed to him, many skies and roads that ran beneath them. And he saw them too. Ghost riders on dead horses whose wild gallop made his heart beat faster. Ivor saw what these riders were doing to other worlds, how they were conquering worlds, enslaving peoples, killing those who resisted. He knew it was only a matter of time before they came to this world. Astonished and tormented by visions of an unstoppable army, Evil Eye began to speak of the danger from beyond the borders of the worlds between. There were those who listened and those who thought he was mad. The latter were led by Arnegad himself, but Ivar could not stop now. He gathered all his most loyal men around him, those who could believe as fervently in the danger of the wild hunt. And together they began to act. They had long since abandoned the principles of the School of the Bear, and they set out to conquer Heron Kadok for themselves. They betrayed their mentors and even tried to murder Arnegad. They were dangerous, but they were too few for a coup. Arnegad survived and Ivor and his followers fled south, far away, far enough not to worry about Arnegad's possible revenge. 
They stayed in the mountains of Tertaker, in the fortress of Gorthurgh Bay. Unfortunately, there is almost no information about the history of their journey, nor about who owned Gorthurgh Bay before the witches arrived. Only descriptions of this fortress on the eastern border of Ebbing are known. Its walls were built into a truly impregnable mountain range. But it was nowhere near as cold as, say, the fortress of Heron Kedok. Gorthuk Vale was surrounded by a huge chasm, at least a hundred paces deep. There was only a narrow stone bridge spanning it, and in the middle of the moat was a stone tower with a spiral around it, the symbol of a viper. The water that flowed in the chasm around Gothic Vade quickly became poisonous. The waste of alchemical reagents turned it into a foul-smelling mud whose fumes alone could kill. It was here that the new school of witchcraft was founded, the School of the Viper. The students who grew up in these conditions were pale and often had much lighter pupils. Throughout their training, they were taught to hate only one evil, the wild hunt. The rest came with the territory. Therefore, witchers came out of the walls of their school less prepared for other orders. It was necessary to earn a living, and the easiest work remained orders for humans. Hired hits. This is how the witchers of the school of the Viper became the best mercenaries of the South. They were not bound by the code. Only one ambition stood above the rest, the ambition to destroy the wild hunt. The rest of the moral boundaries were crossed quietly. In time, the school of the Viper became famous. It developed its own style. Paired short blades were their weapons, and fast and furious blows from both hands turned into a whirlwind of death that was effective against both monsters and humans. The children were trained in a special way, of course. Each newcomer to Gothic Vade was assigned an animal to take care of. Over the years of training, the future Witcher became attached to it. But before leaving for the highway, and after mutations and training with the pet, the young witchers were ordered to kill the animal. It was a compulsory test, a trial, and from that moment on, the students were no longer afraid to kill. And so, the new two witcher schools were born. You might ask, what about the others? They stayed, but from that moment on, everything in their lives changed. There was no more brotherhood, there was no more unity. Everyone felt like they were on their own in this world. Each year, Fewer and fewer witchers returned to Castle Morgrake for the winter. Her former fame and status were gone. Many of the new brothers knew nothing of the first era of witchers, so they were nervous. As the years dragged on, the tension in our ranks grew. The witchers that traveled through the south began to meet new witchers wearing medallions with the head of a bear or a curly viper. They told stories of a witch's school called the School of the Bear, built by Arnegat in the Emil Mountains. They told of witchers from the south who sold their skills to anyone for any contract, and of the cruel betrayal that nearly killed Arnegad and spawned a secret order of witchers united by the poison of the viper. The process of the final fracturing was unstoppable. New schools would arise, none of the order would remain in Morgrig, but that's another story and a whole different video. Leave a like if you enjoyed this video and subscribe to our channel. Click on the bell to never miss any of our videos. Write about what the author might have gotten wrong, what you don't understand, or what you disagree with. Let us continue discussing what you guys think about the development of the Witcher universe that the writers of CD Projekt Red offer us. All data for this video was taken from the recently released and translated board game The Witcher by CD Projekt Red. The accompanying A Witcher's Journal book plus the Way of the Witcher expansion pack for the Gwent trading card game, as well as the journey named The Road to Maribor for the same Gwent game. Putting it all together was definitely not easy. Do thank us with a comment and a like. Support our creativity on Patreon and with a direct sponsored subscription right here on YouTube. In any case, thank you guys for watching and see you soon when The Old Witcher speaks once more.